Hello, everyone. I'm Bertine Premacor West, CEO of Westbridge Solutions, and I want to thank you for joining me for our third interview in this week-long series for She Means Business, celebrating Women's History Month. And today I am delighted to be with the, the two that served as the catalyst for this interview series in my brain. So um, Dr. Kendra Washington-Bass and Kelly Peaks-Horner, thank you all from the Lucy Leadership Project for joining me today. So say hello to all of our listeners and our audience. Hello. Thanks for having us. <laughs> oh, thank you for being on here. And you guys, as I said, were the ones to, to put this idea into my head. And we're going to talk a bit about why towards um, the latter part of this interview. But I'm so grateful to you all. And I am just I, I'm having this wonderful opportunity this week to interview not only dear friends, but respected colleagues and dynamic women um, for this series and this particular day in the field of education leadership. So for those who might be tuning in for the first time, uh, what we're going to discuss in our time together, during our time together, is trailblazing leadership, innovation and challenges, empowerment through mentorship, work-life harmony, and then the vision for the future. So to get you all acquainted, I'm going through all my screens here. So to get you all acquainted with Kelly and Kendra, I'm going to read their bios to you so you know who they are. So Dr. Dr. Kendra Washington Bass, oh my gosh, I'm getting tongue tied y'all. That's how excited I am. Okay. Uh, Kendra is a Black mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend, and a woman of God. She treasures her time with her family and friends and loves engaging in deep discussions about life. She declares her Blackness boldly and strongly because it's an important identifier to understand who she is and how she navigates the world. So she learns from each interaction and transforms her own thinking during that. So she loves to laugh, though she can be serious, and, but she is very serious about ways to improve the lives of the people that she meets. She's here for a purpose in life, and her life's journey is to fulfill that purpose. So she believes that every encounter and interaction is a learning moment, that acquiring knowledge and skills will help her become more equipped to serve others. She's passionate about sharing what she's learned and helping others navigate the spaces while maintaining who they are. I can attest to that because Kendra sure. has been a mentor and a friend to me um, for our Panera Power <laughs> sessions um, where we would meet and, and just talk about all the things. So yeah. I really love that about you, Kendra. Thank you for helping shape my journey into my own leadership role. I'm forever grateful for that. And so what does, so Kendra has um, some more information about her, some fun stuff that I do want to share as well. She is a Star Wars fan, Baby Yoda, aka Grogu. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Right here. Okay, right here. <laughs> love it. Love it. Um, she loves things sci-fi. And when she needs a pick-me-up, she chooses one of her all-time favorite movies, The Twilight Zone, Jaws, Aliens, Jurassic Park, The Birds, Poltergeist, or The Matrix Reloaded. So Kendra is also an alumnus of Notre Dame. So go Irish for all of you out there. Go Am I Irish. To say go Irish? I think yes. I can say that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just give a little shout out to all the St. John's people watching us as well. So <laughs> I don't know that we have a slogan, but go Irish for all of you Notre Dame alumni out there. And lastly, fun thing about Kendra, she really enjoys vacationing with her family and she looks forward to it every year and creating lifelong memories. So welcome, Kendra. Thank you so, so much. I'm here for all of it. Yes, yes. And Kelly, <laughs> Kelly is a white mother, wife, daughter, sister, friend, and spiritual being. Her best days include spending time with her family, good friends, by having deep conversations, especially with her adult daughters, about navigating life and being a good citizen of this world. She's keenly aware of her privilege as a white woman and makes it an important aspect of her life's work to listen and learn from Black women and other marginalized communities. Learning is key for how she shows up in every room, and she wholeheartedly believes that joy can be integrated in hard work, laughter with serious discussion, and love with discourse. Kelly believes that all people are genuinely doing the very best they can, and along with that belief is is along with that belief is essential to how she creates healthy boundaries for herself and others. She believes every individual has value and something to contribute to this world. 
So some, some more fun things about Kelly. Let me widen my screen, you all, because you all have so much wonderful information to share out here. Okay, so some more fun things about Kelly. Uh, she has a book buying issue. It is a problem. We may have to have an intervention for her at some point, but yeah. I'm not mad at that because again, <laughs> leadership education. So this is how we feed the mind. <laughs> she right. loves nature and outdoors. She, she uses hiking as her exercise of choice and a great way to cleanse her mind. She practices yoga, though she's not interested in colonized yoga with goats, chickens, or unique settings. Rather, she's keenly interested in both the physical and spiritual practice of yoga as it was meant some 5,000 years ago. So she adores her family, her friends, and her two adult daughters. And I have to say, she's also a proud dog mom. That's yeah. right. Oh, yes. A little rosy. A little rosy. So, little rosy. So welcome to this, the show. I want to say, Kelly, I'm so excited to get into this with you all. So let's just dive in. So right. first question, reflecting on leadership. So reflecting on your journey, how could you share a pivotal moment where you had to break through a significant barrier or stereotype within your industry? How did this experience shape your approach to leadership and influence your ethos as a trailblazer for other women? That is the, the most loaded question to get started. Thank you for that. I mean, we're, we're, <laughs> we're heavy hitting. Softballs. Bertine, let's just start with softballs. This is, you know, just- Right, you, you're, you're, you're going straight into the major leagues. Love it. Um, this is how leaders lead, right? This is how we play out here. Just, just jump right in, huh? <laughs> uh, and we only have 30 minutes. Okay. I know. Uh, I, know, I, know. I, I will start first, Kelly, and then I'll I'll try to be succinct so you can see also maybe some trends or some cross over in Kelly's story. So my most pivotal moment, I would say there were dual. So one was when I was in college and another sort of later on in my career. And both of them left me with similar feelings. So at these junctures in my life where um, growing up and having positive images of who I am, positive representation, tons of encouragement, lots of support, I needed that for the battle that I was about to wage. Uh, and it happened in college when, for the first time, I felt like I was not seen, heard, or that I felt like um, my, my worth as a human being was being challenged. Um, going to a predominantly white institution, sometimes people say that's par for the course, but it was the first time for me in my life as a young person away from home, where I experienced just the consistent wave of why are you here, you know, basically questioning my credentials as a student there. Um, and, and some of it very explicit and overt. So that was the first part of it. And then that's what actually led me to be a come, become an educator. That was the pivotal moment in the journey that I became a teacher and said, There's, there has to be a way that students can have enough of the skills, the knowledge to push through an environment similar to that. And what can I offer? And that was one continuing to do what was um, taught to me, provide as much of the encouragement and love and care and the support that when students of color who I was teaching and leading were in the world, they had enough in their pockets, they had enough in their souls to, to push through the, the challenges that they were going to face. It wasn't not whether they were gonna or not. And then I had, a, 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 I think, a, I would say a nice sprint of success, yes, some setbacks, but I think I was really in the groove until I hit another point in my life when I felt like, wait a minute, I've been doing this really, really hard work. I have felt like I met a high level of expectations that I've gained a certain knowledge and expertise. And here again was the wall. And for and in this case, as a, a, a person in leadership, 
not being promoted and being told that I still was worthy is just not worthy enough. And in exchange for someone who did not have the same level of experience that I did led me to go, all right, here's another point in the life that I need to um, use to make a shift. And that led me to, um, I guess the, the quote of betting on yourself, yep. taking the power and control and not waiting for someone to tell me that I have worth um, and to recognize when I'm being used and recognize that I'm not being rewarded for those things. So how can I put myself in a position to feel and produce and share my knowledge and skills in a way that is supportive to the communities that I serve in education, but also um, uplifting in my soul. And so that is what pivoted me to find new employment, find a place, be unapologetic about what it is that I want, what values um, are aligned, what I will and will not stand for. Um, and also to grow this work on Lucy Leadership Project. So that's led me to where I am today. Excellent. I'll pass it off to Kelly. Awesome. Yes, Kelly, do share. So, and let me know if I should reread the question because I know it's a big one. Yeah. Um, why don't you just reread it for, for the listeners just so they, yeah, that might be helpful. So reflecting on your journey, could you share a pivotal moment where you had to break through a significant barrier or stereotype within your industry? How did this experience shape your approach to leadership and influence your ethos as a trailblazer for other women? Um, I have been in education in some way, shape or form for almost, well, probably a little over 40 years. And it's taken a variety of kind of iterations from starting in a school district to president of a teacher's association to being in HR. And then I was actually at the corporate level for um, about 16 years where I was in the education practice, still working with school. So I've never had my hands outside of school work. It's always been somehow associated with schools. But in the, in my last um, formal work assignment, um, I think the best way to describe it was um, mixed messages that are would be close to gaslighting. Mm -hmm. And I was um, I was a senior consultant and I managed all the projects, but there was a component of my job that was a sales component too. Um, and so for me, one of my jobs was to manage those so that one, we kept the client, but also that we continued to do more good work. And I was really good at it. In fact, I was the company's top um, middle market manager for several years running. You know, they would call me on stage. They would call me out in front of the entire company. And I would get, I mean, I had more orbs on my, on my um, <laughs> bookshelf, you know, for um, meeting quotas or doing whatever that was. So uh, that was one message. But then the other message was do that but stay within this box. Don't go outside this box. And outside that box meant um, just keep selling so that others can have something to do, really. Um, and in particular, um, it was that the, those others were around um, other members of the team that played more of the political game than I did. Um, and just to be honest, it was, um, keep selling so that we can lift, um, the white males that were within, um, our team. And so after trying to figure out how to navigate this for so long, where this was my job, but really you just want me to do this part of it, stay within these. And, and I'm going to describe it this way because after some, after some therapy, this is how I described it to my therapist at the time. I said, I feel like, I feel like a caged animal, like a, almost like a, a, a leopard or something that, you know, how they, you, you see that and they just keep, they, they just, there's no beginning, middle or end. I, I just was in this spiral and I was just, I said, I feel like this caged animal. 
So what I realized after too long of a period of time is that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I can't fix it. It's this culture came before I did. It's going to live a lot longer than I did. And so my decision is, do I stay in it and accept it? Or do I say, I'm going to go someplace else where I can be all the things I know I can be and be accepted for all those things. And so I made the decision to leave. And that was, that was pivotal. Um, after going on a journey of, um, you know, applying for everything across the board, not wanting anything that I wanted to apply for, someone asked me a, a, the critical question. A friend said, well, describe to me what your best days at work were. And I said, it was when I was meeting with school leaders and we were, you know, white, whiteboarding. And it's how Kendra and I met. You know, we were, we were dreaming. We were what it could be. And I was making an impact. And I was, and they said to me, figure out how to do more of that. And so that was pivotal for me. Very, very pivotal for me. Um, and then I would say one other time was, this was in the same environment. Um, the CEO had invited the top um, consultants to a day with him to do some strategizing and sharing. And, and it was me and I think maybe one or other, two other women in the room. And we had to go around and talk about, you know, our, our, what we were doing and how we were a question very much like this, like how were we overcoming barriers? And I remember talking about how I was talking to this one superintendent. And I remember saying this to the superintendent, when he said, well, we don't have, I don't know if we have the money to do it. And I said, give me your budget and I'll go through your budget. And I will, I will show you what we can do. That's more impactful than probably what you're doing right now. And as I was telling this story, I was getting more and more animated. And there was another white male in the room. And he said, why, why are you so angry about this? And I was like, I'm not angry. I said, here's the difference between what you sell and what I sell. I said, when, when, when I can make an impact in the school district with our clients, I'm creating better days for teachers and students. And that makes me excited. And so, so, you know, don't step on my, don't step on my flame. Mm -hmm. Don't, 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 you know, don't, don't step on my excitement. And if I get animated, it's because I know that some, in some cases, it's a matter of good days or bad days for kids and teachers and others. So there's a mission you know, within that. And so that was pivotal around anything I ever do moving forward has to have that kind of impact or the potential for that kind of impact. I love that, ladies. I love that so much. So, you know, I'm going to relate this to a personal SWOT analysis because that's what you all went through, right? I need to just have a shirt that says that, <laughs> but <laughs> but that's what you all went through. And in doing so, you created boundaries. And, and because we're friends as well as colleagues, um, you know my feelings about boundaries creating liberation, right? Yes. So you created boundaries and then you were able to pivot and set the course for yourself that you authentically belong in. So as you both were saying that you saw what was happening to you while you're living your life. You, you made me think of that moment where I was just like, you know what? I don't want to show up how people expect me to show up anymore. Right. I want to show up as, because that was a part of me, but I want to show up as the whole me, right? right. And that is, that is the moment where you were free, but then there's a power that you've reclaimed and then you have a responsibility to yourself because you now recognize the power that you have, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a, you all, you know, I could talk to you for days. Okay, we're moving <laughs> to the next question. So now this is innovation and challenges. So innovation often comes with its own set of challenges, especially in the fields where women are underrepresented. So can you discuss an innovative project or initiative you led and the obstacles you encountered along the way? How mm -hmm. did overcoming these challenges contribute to your personal and professional growth? And uh, do you mean this in our current work as Lu in Lucy Leadership Project? Yes. Or yeah, okay. Because that yeah. that shaped like what you were, you know, in your prior yeah. lives. Yeah. Right? yeah, I think has shaped so much of what Lucy Leadership Project stands for: its vision, its mission, and and the challenges along the way that caused you to create it. So yeah. yes, from the Lucy Leadership Project perspective. So I think one of the things that's quite interesting is 
why we have dared to do this work as women and our mission is to support women leaders, specifically in the education field, we are right in the middle of the inequity stew. As a company, as a company, and as two women who are, you know, interracial um, in terms of our facilitation, in terms of our work, we are everything that people want to put down. Right, we represent um, uh, a anomaly to the stereotype. We represent the um, anomaly to the socialization of us being in our place. And by virtue of Lucy Leadership Project being in existence, it acts as an agent of disruption. So the challenges are right in our face when we are um, pitching for opportunities to speak, um, when we are promoting our book and getting people to buy it and having to share why it's important that men um people who are mainly those in, those individuals who are in leadership positions that make the decision to hire us that becomes a, a I wouldn't call it a barrier even though it it is but it is absolutely a challenge that we're willing to meet uh so I think that is what um it, this question finally got me to understand why I have been frustrated. The, I mean, it, like I was in a serious funk in January, like what is happening? Why are we butt up, up against these, these, these sort of no calls, you know, and I'm, we're like, well, we got a, a different marketing strategy. I mean, you know this, we were just, we're beating our heads and then realizing, huh, Wait a minute. We're in a system that is um, so. This is a little bit of a, a insight into sort of the public school system as a structure. It's initiative driven, right? Not necessarily systems change, sort of encompassing. Some do it very well, but it's like, what's the next nine, shiny new object? Like, there's a sense of urgency in education all day long. And so when something doesn't stick for five minutes, they're on to the next one and on to the next one. We don't want to be caught in that cog, but they're looking for us to be a shiny new object. And that's against our values, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, who we represent. We represent um, equity. And right now, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are under attack. Yes, indeed. Right? With You know, school systems are... School systems are getting rid of their DEI programs, getting rid of their DEI or equity offices. There are laws that are making people so fearful they can't even say the equity word, right? Yeah. So here you have Kelly and I, we're talking about the inequities in gender and racial um, um, education and the, the stereotypes that exist within the education field that perpetuates it. And they're like, whoa, we don't want you, right? You you yes. represent what we are scared of, right? And then the third part is just the business, the business alone and the idea and the socialization that we need to take crumbs. So we butting up against sort of the gender gap in terms of pay, in terms of presence, in terms of voice. So we are really in the middle of the stew and Kelly and I are like, well, we going in there. But it wasn't until you just asked this question that it all made sense as to some of those underlying um, roadblocks and barriers and doors and things that we are coming up against as a as a partner in this work. I love that. So technically, the question caused further unwrapping, if you it, will. Oh. You, know you, see, you see that dropping are you, bars are you and talking, gems? Are you talking about this? Are you talking about I'm this? talking about that. I'm talking about, about that. Dropping bars and gems, ladies. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, so Kelly, so pop of you. I mean, well, I will say this before I, I pass the mic to Kelly. It seems, and Kendra, that that these challenges have served as the catalyst for you to push innovation forward because that's what sure. equitable, you know, structures look like, right? That looks like. Mm -hmm 
to me on this end, business innovation, because the school system is a business, it right? Is. And so this is what that looks like to me. Kelly, I'm passing the mic to you. What do you say? It's, and this is why we work so well together, because this is exactly what popped into my head um, <laughs> with, with some experiences that we've had. So, and I don't know if I ever told this to Kendra, I may have told you this, but when we first started, one of the things that um, I wanted to make sure, sure of as we facilitated to facilitate together is I wanted to make sure that I showed up equitably between she and I in our co-facilitation. And so I reached out to some, some people, um, shout out to Val Brown, Brown from Carnegie, um, mm -hmm. and just had a conversation around, you know, what, what should I be aware of? What should I, so that and so one of the things she said to me has always stuck with me. And for any of ed educators or anyone in professional, anyone in leadership development or development at all, she said this to me and it has stuck with me. And she said, to the extent that anyone who facilitates any kind of workshops can do that with a person of color or a person who has been, who has been historically marginalized within the, the systems that you are presenting to, do that because she said you're going to come from one framework and you're going to come from your own experiences as a white woman so when i you know when i'm up there and i'm telling women education leaders you know be vulnerable that's different for me as a white woman than it is for women of color members of the hb uh l l lgbtq plus ia i mean it just yeah. i went to say them and i went thank you so you see <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, that's partnership. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, me members of the disability community, any of those, right? So, so that means something different based on your lived experiences. And it can also mean something different depending on the culture and the systems that we're working in. Um, and so I needed to have um, a bigger lens on what we, uh, beyond my own experiences and my own privilege, uh, privileged experiences, because the systems were, systems are intentionally set up for that, right? So that's one of the things that as we entered into this work, um, as a as the white woman component of our partnership, I needed to be acutely aware of. Um, and I think a couple of things that we, and because of that, and because of the way we work together, you know, intersectionality is a value of ours. And yeah. that th that doesn't always exist in schools around professional development. It is, this is the way to do it. This is the way I want you to do it. Now go do it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're up against is we have a very different way of delivering, say, for just example, a presentation or a keynote. You know, a lot of times what they're looking for are performers. We're not performers. We're we, you, yes, we're educators. We're and if you can a keynote that's going to make people uncomfortable in a good way, thinking, digging deep, really reflecting, then we're, we're, we're your women to do that. But if you want us to pace the stage back and forth and to yell, we don't do that. We don't do that. And, and because of that, that's a challenge for us because that we're competing with the, with a lot of the performers um, out there as well. Sure. We don't perform. We just are another value of ours is to disrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're not performers. We're disruptors in, and, and we're, we, we, um, we're good at that. I think that's what we're really good at. And we have had situations where, you know, she and I are presenting together. And when we get to the part where we talk about, you know, how can, and let's just say it's white women in the room, how can you leverage your privilege for the other women that are in this room? And you can feel that, col that collective, <gasps> Yeah. You know, or you see them get uncomfortable or they tell you afterwards that really made me uncomfortable or the leader of the group says that made them. A, we don't apologize for that. Good. We need to be uncomfortable. Now, your job is to unpack what made you feel so uncomfortable about that, because it is the reality. It is what it is. Um, so I think that is, you know, a lot of it and that. It, and I'm I'm with Kendra 100 percent. I really think that's at the core um, because it, it's we are a visual representation of what they are afraid of. And we are a visual representation of what some states are getting rid of. 
um, because they're afraid of it. And and when we're asked to deliver something, but you know, can you not? I was asked to come into oh. a state and flat out told, hear the words you can't say. Yeah. And I said, I'm saying them anyway. That's not my value system. I'm saying them anyway. And guess what? The earth did not open up and everyone didn't fall into a big deep hole. <laughs> right? We, right? We rumbled with it instead. Yeah. And I know we're on the right track when I see, especially, you know, women of color or those who have been historically marginalized or voices just silenced, shake their head and look at me and say, I need to say it as a white woman. I need to say it and they need to hear it. So I think that's what we're up against, but we make no apologies for it. Yeah, I love it. And when you, when you, Kelly, were describing what a presentation with you and Kendra looks like, I have the benefit of having real life access to y'all, right? <laughs> and for me, I see, I see the, the dish brewing and then being served is a whole other component to just the beautiful, uncomfortable, mm -hmm. critical conversation that is you both, right? Personified, right? And so this leads me to a term that you, you both tend to use all the time that I think perfectly encapsulates who you are, what you bring and why you bring it. And that's co-conspirators, mm -hmm. right? You, co you all know, I know that book. Okay, <laughs> so you are co-conspirators. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're co-conspirators in creating equitable change, right? And so that that I love the, your teaching styles that I really think only educators such as yourselves can bring. Because to your point about performances, right? I I tend to repel uh, performative anythings. Um, and so as as a professional speaker. I, I say, you know, not all money is good money. And by that, I'm not talking about amounts of, of money, revenue that we generate from speaking, but rather, what does the speaking require of me? Because yeah. if it's a pound of flesh for the sake of just showing up in this face at a random place, that's not enough. That's not enough for me to honor the commitment that I've made to this work. And I know that the both of you feel that way mm -hmm. about how you show up in spaces as well, because People are going to say, yes, just, just be here and do that. But this is not, you know, and I will use triggering language for people. This is not a minstrel show, right? It is yeah. not that type of environment. You are here to affect change and change requires a level of reflection, contemplation in order yeah. to get to that other side, because there is that uncomfortable space, but we all need to sit in it and to get sure. to the transform the transformative joy that awaits us at the end right? And joy to me is equity, right? Mm -hmm. If I can show up in a space where I'm valued for everything that I'm bringing, and by that, I mean, I don't have to suffer from, you know, um, pay that's different, access right. that's different, right? Um, I'm not being placed as, um, you know, uh, I'm not being tokenized because right. that that can happen to us, whether we're white, whether yeah. we're black, Latino, indigenous, um, Asian, that can happen to us by sheer virtue of us being female or fitting whatever slot that might be, right? So I love just the visual you created because I, I and that's why I really was so excited to, to have you all on here and celebrate you and the work that you do because I know the, the kind of price that is paid to just show up being yourselves, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're moving on. Let's talk okay. about empowerment through mentorship. So the role of mentorship is invaluable in shaping careers. Could you tell us about a mentor who played a crucial role in your development? And additionally, how do you approach mentorship within your communities to empower the next generation of women leaders? And by your communities, I mean the community of either Notre Dame as Kendra does, or the community of women educators as you both do, or Kelly, through your new series on Facebook, your community of people who are watching you be by the lakeside. Tell us about that, yeah. Yeah, why don't you guys start, Kelly, since you, Lakeside Reflections. Lakeside Reflections, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so mentorship, you know, this, this is, um, this goes back a long, long way. And I'm not so sure it was mentorship, but when I think about who the person was that was pivotal for me when I used to hear her, 
um, when I was president of the Teachers Association in Fairfax, there was a national leader at the National Education Association um, by the name of Mary Hatwood Futrell. Um, I think she's retired now, but she went on to be the first international um, education association president. And then she went to teach at George Washington University, I believe it was. Um, but every time I heard her speak, she gave us a collective, but I felt like the thousands of people that were in the room were gone and she was just speaking to me. And she would always say this one thing, I actually have it on my wall. She would always say, if not now, when, if not me, who? And that has been almost the mentor mantra, you know, where I go back and go, what would Mary say? What would Mary tell me to do? What would, and then when I either think, uh, I don't know if I can do that now, or I'm a little afraid. And then I, I hear her say, Kelly, if not now, when, and if not mm -hmm. you, who are you waiting on? You know, and then what does that look like? And then I can go into my own um, kind of, of, of work around then at that. And so that's, that's the person that comes to mind every time I think of, you know, who's inspired me, who's helped me, who's, whose voice do I always hear um, when I go to do something. And then in terms of mentorship, um, you know, one of the, one of our values at Lucy Leadership is also community and building community. And here's, here's another thing. This, this, response actually Bertine kind of goes in with um the other question that you asked and that is one of the one of the cultural practices within education is we sit back and we wait for others to tell us what we need to be professionals we need we wait for others to tell us this is a professional development you need. These are the training you need. This, So we just sit back and wait. And one of the things we're saying to women, yes, that's happening because, you know, school systems have to keep you up to date on what their objectives are, whatever. But there's another piece that's happening. And that is for you to take, especially as women leaders, control of your own professional development, your own professional journey. And so what does that mean? One, create your own community. Create your, don't wait to be picked. You know, we wait to be picked. Start your, we wait to get into cohorts. We wait to get, so who is it within your own community that maybe are mentors for you, are coaches for you, or other women who want to go on that, create, curate and, and create that um, um, for yourself. And then what does that look like? So that is a huge, um, this idea of community. So when I do, um, when, when Kendra, and Kendra, I won't steal your thunder, but when Kendra launched oh. this month, her yeah. her women her women's uh, history month um initiative i was yes. like oh, darn it i have to go on camera because that's just not as part of my thing but i have to, and i had to figure out what can i do that's comfortable for me and i am you know blessed enough to live in an incredibly beautiful environment our house sits right on a lake and i thought how do i share that and it's actually something kendra and i talked about years ago is how do we how do we how do i we you know, share collectively um, kind of what we have. So right. I started these, um, what I call Lakeside Reflections. It's a virtual space for women educators to come and just take that beat, you know, take that moment. I mean, there, there may be two minutes, three minutes tops. And sometimes I did one just on breathing, you know, just mm -hmm. breathe. Um, I did another one on... Um, well-being you know how you doing what's going on who's asking you that during your day you know if no one's asking you jump on lakeside reflections i'll ask you right um, and so so once we develop those kinds of communities i think what we are developing is the capacity and the agency to become co-conspirators with each other and what is a co-conspirator so you know, we used, and, and we're going to give a shout out to Dr. Patina Love um, because she teaches this beautifully. You know, an ally is 101. An ally is, uh, I'm just starting. I'm learning the words. I'm figuring it out. But it's 101. It's ground level. Accomplice is, I'll stand next to you. I might not speak up, but I'll be behind you going, you go, girl. You know, you got this. Um, what do you need? But a co-conspirator says a couple of things. One, I'm willing to risk something. 
Um, I'm willing to put myself not only next to you, but maybe even in front of you. Um, I'm willing to um, speak up for you, but it takes it, but that doesn't happen automatically. It takes this groundwork around building community, finding our mentors, finding our people, um, finding and, and finding the people who can bear the weight of our stories um, that are in our lives. So that's where I see that that's my personal experience around uh, mentorship, because I just I don't, there's barely a week that goes by that I don't hear Mary talking to me um, in some way, shape or form. And then all of that is just part of the value system in the work that we do at Lucy Leadership. I love it. I love it. So I'm going to, I'm going to slightly pivot Kendra's version of this, right? Because mm -hmm. um, you did mention Kelly and thank you for bringing this to mind. So we're putting Kendra on the spot now, which she is used to, but <laughs> um with the, the Women's History Month TikTok that you're doing, I commend you because that requires a level of dedication that I know many of us do not have because she is every day and I can depend upon it. Every day I'm like, oh, there she is. Okay, let's see the message, right? So I want you to talk about um, who was your mentor, but also talk about that TikTok journey for Women's History Month and your role in mentorship through that, because that's what that looks like to mm -hmm. me. It's a celebration, but it's also mentorship. So talk yeah. about how you're holding people's hands virtually through that experience. Yeah. So um, I can't, there, there are a number of women, and I will say that women who I credit for helping me be me. It's a combination of a lot of women. And I've always maintained that the women in my family were my best teachers. Um, I was blessed to know my great, great grandmother. Um, there's a picture of my great, great grandmother, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother and me. It's called the, the five generations picture. Um, and I think I'm, it might've been like an Easter picture or something like that, but we're all standing sort of in a row. And they were the ones who took care of everything. They were the ones who doled out the advice. They were the ones who managed the household. They managed the finances. They took in those who needed shelter. They fed them, um, th they were the ones. And so when I hear voices, in my head, I hear, it depends on the moment. I hear my grandmother's voice. I hear my mother's voice. I hear my great grandmother's voice. Um, and as a family, we continue to tell those stories. I mean, I think unique to um, African-American communities is still to me, this, this presence of a griot, that there is the designated storyteller who keeps the, the voices of people long gone alive. And, and that is a value in my family. The person who continues that right now is my mother. So my mother is the culmination of all of those voices because she's the only one that's still alive. And so she continues to share knowledge and wisdom from those women through her to me. So she's my my best at best and top priority mentor in my life. Um, and it, it becomes a value for me. So in shifting from sort of hustling <laughs> in the world of work for my worth to finding worth in the work that I currently do required me to surround myself with with love and I look at women as symbols of love. So I surround myself with them. And I was very conscientious about curating the support system moving forward that not just anyone would have access. And I did not want to be around anyone who was sort of a, li a, a, a life sucker not people who are ch having challenges. I'm talking about those who just don't want to see you shine, those who are in competition, those who those who have some of the characteristics and ideology of what we fight up against every single day. And that also includes women who will perpetuate 
gendered racism. Sure. Absolutely. And so I was like, all right, with this new phase in my life, I also need to make sure that I am in a, a different community of support and love. And I looked for it too. I was just like, well, well, what's already out there, right? Is there a, is there a club? Is there a something I can join? And as I watched some, it just, it just didn't pull me. I was just like, ah, uh, I don't want to be in a club where we just bitch want and moan. I don't want to be in a club where we are just gossiping. I don't want to be in like the book club when you just fake reading a book and then just drink wine. Like, and, and there's a place for that. But I was like, that's not what I need from a soul and identity and recovery. So I said, not waiting for someone to tell me to come. Let me create. Mm-hmm. And hence, Sister Saturday was born. And it started out initially as I would like to, um, my husband and I always talk about the dining room. Like, I don't know why we have a dining room. We never sit in there and we ever eat, right? Like that's probably at most people's houses now. Yes. You know, we don't necessarily use the dining room. And we have a dining room that seats eight. And he's like, we never really in there. And I was like, I'm going to use this dining room. There's something about breaking bread. There's something about having a meal, about sitting around a dining room table that symbolizes to me um, sort of the filling not only of your body, but your mind and your soul. So I said, I wonder if I just fill this dining room with women that I want to be in community with and have um, deep and rich conversations um, share ideas, provide support, do all the things that I was not seeing in communities that were already curated. And I was like, all right, so I need seven women. And I was like, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's more than seven. And I was like, I can't pick just seven, which also gave me an aha that they were right there. Waiting the for time. you to start this. The yes. whole time. And I was like, oh, shoot. I think, be honest with you, uh, Bertine, even when I send like the reminders for Sister Saturday, I think I'm sending it out to almost 60 women. Oh, I'm certain. I'm certain. You I think are. Just, so, so, and there are more that are just joining or curious. So yeah, I created that community of support that we meet once a month to have to, to fill our to fill our souls with love and honor and respect and authenticity like you show up as who you are you show up as who you want to become to right it's like show up who you are but you're gonna leave transformed and we've seen and Bertine you've been a critical part of the transforming women in that they have no idea what they're coming into sometimes <laughs> and what they're leaving with like Oh, I thought we were just going to eat and talk. Like, no, 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 bamboozled. This is a whole (laughs) different environment. And I think that is, that is a portion of Lucy Leadership Project. That is who we are as a collective. And I would, you know, we have a goal of creating a sisterhood that feels like Sister Saturday, that feels like the Lakeside Reflections, that feels like that. And the TikTok challenge was a way to do two things. One, don't ever dare me to do something because I will do it. (laughs) As you know, all of us on here are are Catholics. Guilt will get you, right? (laughs) If they tell us, Bertine, I dare you to do, Kelly, I dare you to do, you know we're going to do it. Okay, so that's it. That's it. It's like, (laughs) all right. so, So I thought, what could I do? boldly that I know I have to do. It's a good dare and I got to stick with it. And I said, I will post every day on TikTok for Women's History Month. And um, one, I also had to learn how to use the platform in a way. So it gave me an opportunity to reconnect with my son on a different way. And it allows him to hear my voice differently than just being mom. Right. That has been an incredible experience growing with him and learning with him. And yeah, I'm curating 
a space. I, what I'm hoping that I'm emitting is what I emit and emote to you all as, as part of the community, right? So sharing part of the book, sharing some of my vulnerable insights, I mean, I don't have a script. And my son's like, do you have a script? Because you short, you you talk like you have a script. I'm like, first of all, that is that conditioning of always sound like you're on point all the time. Like, he was like, loosen up, ma. I'm like, this is as loose as I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, loosen up. I was like, I that's going to take a little bit of transforming that when sure. a camera is on to like loosen up. So I've, I've been working on that. Uh, but the goal is to grow that community there. And it is for a specific group, right? So that's the other thing about social media is that anybody can sort of get on. And I really want you to swipe up, swipe left. If the message is not for you, that's okay. Like I'm not talking to everyone. I'm right. really talking to the women who are just like, they they want they want somebody who who sees them, yeah. who sees them. Like, I don't want a gimmicky. I don't want, you know, I would love to have the followers because it unlocks some great stuff on the back end. But I really want to take people on a journey with us and grow the community that creates a safe belonging space where they are heard and then you know, we can do something about it. it. It's the disruption community we want to create. I love it. I love it. And so what I'm hearing from both of you is that, and this is what I'm feeling, that you're empowering people through mentorship, but there's a price for that. And the price you're paying, you know, happily, willingly, right, yes. is that you're leveraging your professional equity, right? Yep. So you're doing that in order to, to show people who otherwise might not, you know, have the privilege of being in your spaces, right? right? Sure. That I think is the, the liberating part of, of the internet. It's yeah. now you can live locally, but be a global citizen and share your message to Absolutely. everybody. But yet you're speaking your message, though it's shared with everybody, it's for a specific person. Yes. Now that specific person might mean a million people, but you specifically you're speaking to them. So I hope it does make it to a million people. That would Me be too. Let's do this. I'm saying, okay, so now let's talk about work-life harmony, something admittedly I do not have. I have work-life blending and I claim it, I own it. It is mine and I'm sharing it with whoever wants it. So <laughs> I have not trademarked it. <laughs> so in achieving a balance between professional ambitions and personal life, uh, it's a topic of much discussion, again, particularly for women. So how do you manage the demands of leadership while ensuring your personal well-being and fulfillment? What advice would you offer to other women striving to find this balance? And I think this question speaks to what we were talking about earlier. It's going back to boundaries, right? Yeah. And, you know, yesterday you all were on YouTube um, talking about your motivations, again, for creating the book. And, you know, my, my takeaway from that was radical self-care, creating boundaries. So talk to me a little bit about what you do to keep you at your best. How do you make it work? So um, I would say it's an equation. It's well-being plus boundaries. Um, and I like to use the term work-life integration. Um, because there's never a, per if we're in pursuit of a perfect balance, it'll never happen. You know, sometimes work is up here and life right now is down here. And sometimes life is up here and work is down. But how do we, in a healthy way, um, integrate our life and our work, um, so that we're thriving. But the only way to do that is to set he healthy boundaries. Um, so, a and so part of that is, you know, what are the elements to know? What are those elements of life? It, it's it's amazing to me this year in particular, the number one topic Kendra and I are called upon to talk about for educators is well-being because that work-life integration right now is so hard. But here's the other thing. I was speaking with last Friday with a group in Delaware. And one of the things we talked about was, um, you know, schools, schools, did, never closed during the pandemic. They just shifted how they did their work. 
then all of a sudden, without much transition, we just flip the lights back on. And we said, we're open again, doors are open again, let's come in. Without any, um, without, I wouldn't say any, without, and in most cases, without a lot of talk and, and, and recognition of not only what the kids went through, but also what the educators went through and are continuing to go through. And so it's one of the reasons why the well-being of educators collectively is really suffering. And if they're not suffering, they're struggling. And so the first thing is to really identify what does that mean? What are the elements of life that are just really important? Because we miss, we miss um, identify. We sometimes go to self-care. Oh, I'm just going to go take a bubble bath and get a massage and everything's going to be okay. Uh, I'm going to go get my nails done. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to go do, you know, that kind of thing. So it's one, it's identifying what are those elements um, that are really important. And then how do we both individually in our personal lives, but also as leaders, incorporate well-being in our leadership practice a term i want us to put down is anything that has to that's that says it's a soft skill that term drives me nuts because they're mm -hmm. not skills if right. we're driving on our well-being our leadership is going to look different if we aren't able to somehow um moderate our emotions and have emotional agil agility and literacy we show up differently. These are not soft skills. These are hard skills that impact the way we show up for ourselves, for our families, and for the people we're trying to lead. And so a lot of that is how do we how do we create cultures that put the well-being of the people first because we know when they are thriving, they show up and do the work. And in education, that's not where we put the focus. For so long, we've told principals, you have to be an instructional leader. You have to be this. You have to be that. Well, what if we said to them instead, yeah, you need to know something about instruction and good practice, but also we're really going to skill you up on how to create the conditions that, that your teams can show up and do the very best work they can. And then for us, it is also that monitoring of our own well-being. You know, for Kendra, you know, with her three plus five, 10 jobs and things mm -hmm. that she's doing, how does she moderate that, you know, and how does she, and, and I think one of the biggest challenges is from working from home is that you got to say, I'm shutting it down at some point in time. And I'm not walking back into that room until tomorrow morning. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go, I got to send that email um, or you know, uh, practices like I'm not checking email after a certain time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had someone the other day that said they put, um, they actually put in there, um, when you email her, her after a certain time, what comes up is I check emails during the, this time during the day. And this is when you can receive you. You'll, ex I mean, it's nicer than this, but this is when you can expect a response yeah. So that then she can moderate that. Right. So it's those kinds of practices that might sound um, simple and small, but collectively all of those practices and then creating boundaries around. And here, here's the, 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 the term that I like, here's what's or the statement. Here's what's okay. Here's what's not okay. Mm -hmm. And setting those boundaries, not just in our professional life, but in our personal life as well. So it's about work-life integration, incorporating that, it, it, that in our own leadership. And then also us as individuals, um, because we are just better when we are thriving, then we are struggling. I, I like to say it's um, it's a gift that you not only give yourself, but you give to other people. Because I am a better wife, mother, partner, sister, daughter, uh, uh, leader, um, facilitator when I'm thriving than when I'm suffering. Oh, most definitely. I love what you said, Kelly, about, well, all of it, but about specifically this being a, a hard skill because hard skills have to be learned in a way that in a way that's systematic and there's a process within that and so once you've you know mastered one one part of that process then you go up the ascension ladder right and it's like little drops of water at mm -hmm. first it doesn't seem like you know this is moving much right but then it becomes that ocean that can bring a tidal wave and, it's and slow I, I stacking. That, that's the way I was. It's a slow stacking. Yes, yes, I love that. You know, because then we can really claim to. I don't know if I will ever say I mastered it, because I feel like the beauty is in the journey, right? Yeah. Um, and the skill building is in the journey. 
but I know that I'm really different about this and very intentional. And uh, I, I look at it as managing a project, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the project and what is my goal? And so that's how I tend to go through it. And I find that that allows me to also know, like automatically sense, uh oh, this is gonna cause me not to thrive. What can I do to recalibrate? Yes. What, yes. you know, and I always say as I evolve um, in the CEO-ness of myself, the boundaries become ever more present, but it's ever more liberating for me, right? Oh, yeah. So I know my work day, now that I've set these boundaries, um, my work day is on this end, um, usually now five hours, five and a half, right? Um, so I know I have to be as productive as I can be, not busy, but productive, right? And I realize I'm able to do so much more that matters to me in five hours, five and a half hours, than you know, taking 10 hours, just looking at my computer screen and doing some things, but never really moving the needle like I need to, right? So I, I can appreciate that, that look, looking at it as an equation, because for me, that equation requires the input of data. And you all know how I feel about my data. So, yes. <laughs> so Kendra, how are you finding that? Yeah. And I, I mean, I ditto everything that Kelly says, so I'm not even going to repeat I'll just give an anecdote about maybe how that looks in practice mm -hmm. um, for me now and how, how how it's still ever evolving. So um, for, for me, I, I start my day at around eight o'clock and without fail, I use sort of the eight to nine o'clock time to set my calendar, to set my day, to actually set my week. It's the it's the time where I um, can take care of some of the logistical stuff or sort of org management things. <clears throat> and at nine o'clock, I hit my creative stride. So that's when I'm designing and building out things. I'm reading. I'm watching a video. Like I know that I am really good early in the morning and really good late at night. During the day is when I have sort of this lagging. It's when, you know, I'm not as crisp. So I try to do as much as I can in the zones. And so if you want to catch me at my optimal best, you can catch me early in the morning or late in the evening, like after six, then I'm I'm good. Um, I shut down at five o'clock. I, I only work in this space. My laptop does not unplug and go out into the living room. So the office is the office since I do work from home and I don't cross it. Right. I made that at, I made that a I, I made a promise <laughs> to myself and to my family that I wouldn't because for sure in previous work experience, I was working, I was bringing the laptop home and I had it right on my lap in the living room or had the phone or stuff right near the dinner table. It was just, there was no separation. And so I and make sure that there is separation. Um, I am a little more spontaneous than I used to be. I am inserting much more fun, like being able to shift my mind out of work to now like fill up your soul in this way, have fun with people, right? That's part of my bio. Like I believe that every, I leave every interaction with enriching and part of it is laughter and fun. And so if you do call me, it's like, I wanted to go out. I could be busy, but I'm like, wait, I will, I'll meet you for dinner. I'll, a comedy club, let's do that. You know, I, I will, I will show up to shift my mind um, and to have a different experience, which attends to my well-being. It's part of my social well-being. It's part of my community well-being. So I, I I purposely attend to those. And then the other thing that I do is make sure that I have time with my family. Like that is that is a yeah, yes, all the time. And I am. 
the, the evolution or the part that I am work still working through is not feeling guilty or going on PTO, putting that out of office, not checking. No, you can't squeeze in time on the day. Like I'm off. I'm off. Like, sorry, not happening. Actually, not sorry. Uh, sorry, not so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, not sorry. So yeah, and before I would, oh my goodness, it was so bad. I'd be on vacation. I'm like, yeah, I'm on vacation. That's okay. I'll take a call. I took a call one time. I was in no Mexico at a resort. I went back to my room for an hour meeting. I had to take the wet bathing, bathing suit off and put on something more presentable while my family was having margaritas and pina coladas on the beach. And I'm in my room asking the cleaning crew to hold up. I got an hour long Zoom meeting. I said, I, that's just ridiculous. Now that I look back on it, but it was part of my hustling for, I just, I can't say no, because then they're going to think that I'm not a team player. And then they're going to think that I don't care and all that stuff. And I'm just like, and it drives, it actually takes, it takes so much out of you. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm evolving in um, removing the guilt of giving time for myself and shifting the narrative of that selfish to being that is a gift as Kelly just described. I love it. I love it. And I'm not judging because I have done that. And, and I watch my, my family, <laughs> I watch my family be literally on a beach yeah. and I am watching them frolic and enjoy. And I'm like, I just have to send this one message. And I didn't even make it upstairs to the room. I had to just sit in the hotel lobby and do my thing. And the last time I ever did that was years ago. And my husband was like, babe, yeah. you can't do this. <laughs> right. And I thought to myself, I worked so hard to come to this place to have time with these special right. people in my life. Why am I working if I'm not even enjoying this? And, right. you know, ever since then, I'm like, I'll put it away. Um, because I, I do believe very much in keeping, especially when I would be working for my home loss of office, I would get uh, during the height of the, the pandemic, because I've always been a hybrid, I have had a hybrid existence. Um, when the pandemic came around, it was just a, a pivoting of how much time I was spending at home. And of course, circumstances had changed. Mm -hmm. Now everybody was home, right? Um, so I, I got dressed for work. Um, Spanx and all, everyone, I'll claim That's it, right. right? I put perfume on, I put my jewelry on, and I was just like, all right, it's time for work. And then once work was done, I shut it down. I went back upstairs and I lived my life. And, you know, everybody was baking bread. I was making like blueberry everything, like blueberry muffins, blueberry scones. <laughs> I didn't even know I could bake. And I, and, you know, so that's how I enjoyed that part. But if I hadn't done that, had that discipline that a lot of people who do have a hybrid existence don't have um, sometimes, it it would affect not only my productivity, but really my, my family relationships that are mm -hmm. the only reason that I love working so hard is because um, you said something, Kendra, that made so much sense. Um, we're exchanging our value for time, but in actuality, once we disabuse ourselves of that you know, lie that we've been told, right? Yeah. We realize that, and, and I know I've shared this with you all as your consultant, I've said to you, you know, you're exchanging your, your, you're exchanging a service, right? For your time. But that's, that's something, so, well, you're exchanging, I think I need more caffeine. You're exchanging your service for an investment, right? Um, your, how long it takes you has nothing to do with your level of greatness, with your acumen, with your expertise, with any of that. So if somebody is doing something for you, and we talked about this during pricing strategies, if somebody yeah. is doing something, uh, if you're performing a uh, service for somebody, it doesn't matter if it takes you an hour and somebody else 10 hours, what the client is paying for is that service. So you should mm -hmm. price accordingly. Don't get me started on pricing strategies. I know, I know. So I promised everybody that these, these would take 30 minutes. So technically I'm still telling the truth because 30 minutes per person, this episode. So there we go. You see that how works. that accounting works? That's for team mathing for you all. Okay. We call, so, we call that reframing. That's reframing. reframing. There we go. I love my educators. All right, there we go. 
So Thank our last me. question is looking ahead, what vision uh, for the future? Well, what is the vision uh, that you all have for the future of your industry, uh, particularly regarding inclusion and empowerment of women? What steps do you believe are crucial in realizing this vision and how are you contributing to this change? So what do you uh, see happening? Yeah, Kendra. yeah I'll start. Um, so the, the vision, which is, you know, hopefully not so far that we can never see the reality, but hopefully our work is going to set, not hopefully, our work is setting in motion what the vision will realize. And that is that women in education leadership specifically will be represented as such as they are represented in the classroom. So if there are 77% of the women in the pipeline that are leading in classrooms, then it would make sense that that percentage should be almost equal in the positions of leadership within the industry. And that is absolutely not the case. So what we hope to see is not only their the adequate representation, I meaning adequate, meaning, you know, close to the 77% we see, but that 77% also is across spectrums. So you're looking at women of color, you're looking at black women, you're looking at um, women who are part of the LGBTQ plus IA community. You're looking at, um, multilingual women, you're looking at not neurodivergent women. We're looking across the, you know, the intersection of women who are leading schools and being the um, representation that children need to see to change the narrative about what leadership looks like. Yes, indeed. What it sounds like and what it feels like when it comes from a woman. So that's, that's, like big vision and Kelly and I are stepping, we are in the arena to bring, um, to bring awareness more concretely to this problem and not only just the numbers, but what are the actual toll gates that are getting in the way? And we have sort of pulled back some of those layers. We have unwrapped those. Some of it is our own social conditioning, what, how long it takes us for us to put ourselves in the ring to be um, considered for promotion. So that's part of it. The second is to disrupt the actual systems and structures in HR and within um, boards and superintendencies who recommend individuals for promotions. We're also talking about sponsorship, what our role is as we climb a ladder to sponsor women as the role of men to do so. Um, and then the other part is to help women have some of the skill sets needed to ask for what they want, to be clear about it, and also make some decisions about to what degree do they want, as Kelly's described in her own um, origin story, to what degree does she want to, you want to stay in an environment that doesn't recognize your worth? What are you gaining and what are you losing from that? And then the decision is all yours to determine when do you want to experience joy? So long, you know, long answer to sort of very lofty question and goal around moving that needle, but that's what we're in the arena to do. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Kelly, passing you the mic, what's your vision for the future? So I would say all that plus um, at Lucy Leadership, we do have like an em empirical goal. We do have a numbers goal. And that is what Kendra just said, increasing the number of women who are you know, at the C-suite level, or at least just below that kind of level. But there's a second component to that. We, mm -hmm. we can't just look at the numbers. The second component is that they stay there and they're thriving. And so that's where I think we are really sitting, um, is that once they get there, how do we help them to thrive? And, you know, if we look at what we've done historically, we've been gathering, you know, there's been women conferences for years. 
we've been mentoring each other. We've been networking and the numbers still aren't moving. So something's missing. And we aren't saying that women need fixed because we don't need fixed. Right, right. And that's why we use the word unwrap. You, we can't sit in these systems for most of our careers and feel and not understand how they affect us. Mm -hmm. And we can't be socialized in certain ways and not figure out how that affects us. And so it's how do we navigate those systems? What is it that we need to get rid of? What do we need to put down? But then what do we need to pick up at the same time um, so that we can we can not only get there, but also thrive. And then in parallel to that is, how do we change the culture and the systems? Because if you look at the history of just K-12 um, education, women were never expected to be the leaders. It was always the men. And if you look at the prototype of what of who the leader is in most schools, and this is just a broad stroke, it's, you know, it's white male cisgender with a partner at home who's taking care of all the family obligations. And then women get up to those positions. And what governing bodies say is do it just like he did. Right. So, right. All we have to do is look at the data out of the pandemic to see that women's socialization, we haven't come as far as we think we have. And so we're trying to do it just like he did it, but also take care of all the family responsibility. And also, and so he was out seven nights a week. Yeah. But I, you know, and it, and that's no, that's not an indictment on our partners. It's just the way we've been socialized. You know, we can do it and only we can do it and only we can do it right. And only we can. So that's part of what we want women to unwrap is unwrap your origin story. Figure out what it is that um, is, is what do you need to put down? And then what do you need to pick up? What do you really want? Why do you want it? And what's holding you back from going for it? And then once you're there, what do you need to thrive? And, and both individually, but also a systemically, culturally, conditions, all of that. And that's where we're headed. I love it, ladies. Thank you so much. So what I'm hearing is unwrap unpack and unveil. So mm -hmm. I I just, I knew this was going to be fun. I knew it was going to be fun, but it, it was also, you know, every time that we have a conversation about unwrapping, I feel like yet another layer of myself gets unwrapped just by, by sheer virtue of listening to you all continue to unwrap another layer of yourself. So I thank mm -hmm. you for that. And I know our audience is going to thank you for that as well. And so tell everybody where they can find you, what you're what you're up to the big goal for this year 2024 um which is i think a great way to celebrate women's history month right now in particular right we still have a few days left of it so i want people to celebrate it up until the last minute so tell people where they can find you on socials and what you're up to right now um so you can find us at you can find everything you need to find to unwrap uh, at the lucy leadership project um, dot com. So it's our website. So you just go to Lucy Leadership Project dot com. You can find um, how you can purchase our book. You and it's on any um, mainstream book selling, you know, uh, uh, site or whatever. Um, you can get it anywhere. But if you want a quick link, go on the website. It'll take you there. Um, we have created with in partnership and with Bertine, we've created some beautiful learning journey modules so you don't have to go it alone and we wanted to once we wrote the book we said how do we help women take a deeper dive to do their own unwrapping and so you can go in and purchase a module the modules for yourself and go on your own learning journey there's videos of kendra and i walking you through all of the topics there are case studies there are reflective guides to help you really um, go from reading the content to really going on your own learning journey. There's also on there how we work with organizations, schools, um, districts, um, whomever is is wanting. We've got our workshops listed on there. So anything that that you're interested in, um, and we already have some some workshops like on boundary setting. Uh, we do a workshop on well being. 
We do a workshop on value setting. So um, those are already there, but they can also be tailored specifically to a culture or to some very specific objectives, which is one, one of the things that when you're working with a smaller organization, I think is um, our advantage is that it's not, it doesn't have to be customized. It can be customized. It doesn't have to be just a standard. And then if you can't find it, we highly encourage you to just email us and you can do that right off the website and ask us, tell us what you're looking for. We'll set up a call. Um, the other thing that I would say that we are encouraging and, and that you can find on there is to start your own book club. We talked about community, right? We talked about how do you start? How, how do I do? How do I start with my sister Saturday? What do I do? How about everybody get a copy of the book, get your own modules. And then every time you meet, you talk about what you're learning and what you're unwrapping. So start your own book club um, and unwrap together. It doesn't have to be a journey, even though it can be a very personal journey. It doesn't have to be a journey that you that you take by yourself. And the last plug is we have an audacious goal. Hold on, I got, uh, I'll get mine. Go get it. <laughs> 10,000 of these books this year. So our goal is 10,000 of these books in the hands of women, women leaders, women educators, and the allies, accomplices, and co-conspirators who support them. So that's our goal. And each month we will give an update in our newsletter to how we're meeting that goal. And we're, listen, more than one is, 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 is helping to get to that goal. So um, we, we are... We are on our way and we look forward to continued support. First of all, Bertine, thank you so much yes. for giving us this platform, sharing your audience with us. And hopefully um, there continues to be this beautiful synergy and partnership as we we both support each other's work. Yeah, uh, I just, I just want to say that. I mean, Bertine, you were there on day one when we kicked yes. this book off um, in Atlanta, in Georgia, um, January 17th, 2022, three. Three. 2023, um, and you were there as the MC and you helped us. So I, I've always, um, uh, just appreciated you and appreciated the support you've given us from day one. Yes. Uh, thank you. You all, thank you so much. All right. So thank you to our audience for tuning in as well. Kendra, Kelly, you are our sisters in my heart and my respected colleagues, esteemed entrepreneurs and business women, highly respected and regarded educators going around the country, doing the thing, creating co-conspirators and, and leaving no crumbs on the table. That's so right. okay. I wanna just thank you for being phenomenal women. So happy Women's History Month. I'm thank so you. excited to see how people continue to unwrap. And so for everybody tuning in, thank you so much for for you know, stopping by and tuning into this this week long series that that really was sparked by these two amazing women. So you can find us, of course, on LinkedIn, but we're also on YouTube. So everyone, have a wonderful day and catch us for the next episode. Uh, you should be getting that tomorrow. So happy Women's History Month, everybody! Thank you, Kelly Bye. and Kendra. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.